Well, welcome. I'm Marie Harvey. I'm the Associate Dean for Research here in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences at Oregon State University. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our Spring Research Seminar Series. Today will be our fourth seminar that's being delivered remotely. Jonathan Garcia, who is an assistant professor in the Global Health Program, will introduce our speaker today and he will moderate the session and he will provide more about the format for the seminar. So please do enjoy the seminar and join me in welcoming Dr. Garcia. Thanks, Marie. Um, well, welcome to the Friday Research Seminar. We're glad you're all here and able to join us for the College of Public Health uh, Research presentation via Zoom. Uh, we have muted all participants uh, with microphones, as you have already noticed. Uh, to ask a question, please use the chat feature in Zoom. Uh, we'll be moderating the chat and repeating questions. That will be my role uh, here today. As we continue to offer these seminars through Zoom, we'll refine the process and make it better and more enjoyable for everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sunil Khanna. Um, Sunil's talk today will focus on the work he's carried out in Botswana since 2017. And he's been building partnerships with communities and key stakeholders and developing long-term partnerships with communities to address critical issues in the field of uh, global public health. So Neil's research in general focuses on several areas in the field of global health. He's worked on examining the effectiveness of governmental and non-governmental strategies to improve maternal and child health um, issues in India, understanding the effect of increasing the level of healthcare provider cultural competence and humility on improving patient and provider communication and promoting social equity in the United States um, and examining how inclusive, participatory, empowering and sustainable strategies improve health and well-being of people in a manner that is locally relevant, engaging and sustainable. And so without further ado, I give it to Sunil. Thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in on this Friday. Um, this is a slightly awkward um, way of presenting, but uh, hopefully we'll enjoy the seminar. Um, I want to thank Dr. Marie Harvey for inviting me to present um, at the Friday Research Seminar Series. And uh, I was quite excited about this and looking forward to talking something about a topic that is not related to COVID-19 at all. We have been uh, hearing, talking, and listening a lot about COVID, so I thought uh, maybe to talk about something else, uh, perhaps um, talk about things that we used to do before there was COVID and we will continue to do once we our lives get back to something called more normal. So my talk today um, was, titled Challenging the Status Quo in Global Health, is gonna focus on three overlapping themes. And the first theme is about briefly introducing you to the Botswana uh, Global Health Programs, to what we have been doing in Botswana since 2017. And the second theme um, focuses on uh, our experience of conducting research in Botswana uh, that has given us an opportunity to critically evaluate the areas of research and practice in the larger field of global health. And here in this particular uh, theme, I would like to focus on how we can improve global health research and practice by uh, community engagement. And uh, this might help us find locally relevant and su sustainable solutions to global health problems. And the final theme, which kind of emerges out of this, these first two themes, is that the focus will be on lessons learned for, for working with the community. It is one thing that we talk about community-based participatory research um, uh, in our classroom settings, uh, and it's a slightly different experience and slightly pejoratively speaking, uh, different experience of uh, actually conducting community-based research. And the best way to describe would be, it is time consuming, um, it is labor intensive, um, it is messy, 
uh, and uh, the ex overall the experience can be described that shreds and patches sometimes things make sense and sometimes things don't make sense so those are the three broad uh, themes that i would like to focus on in my presentation so uh, first, just talk a little bit about, uh, very quickly about the Botswana Global Health Program. Uh, this program officially started in 2017, but the initial work of imagining this program and uh, seeking support for this program actually began in mid-2016. And uh, that's when this program was uh, conceptualized. And from its inception up to this point, this program reflects the collective effort on part of several people. And some of those people, I'm very thankful to them. They are here, they are listening to this presentation and they have done incredible work in making sure that this program gets off the ground and have been very supportive of the program. So I really wanna thank all of them. Uh, I am just uh, one team member who is part of the program. So I just wanna make sure that you understand that there are a lot many people involved in the program. An important part of this program is to create experiential learning opportunities for our students. And that was one of the ideas uh, behind putting this program together. And uh, we specifically wanted to create experiential learning opportunities for students who came from different disciplinary background, intentionally bring students from engineering, from liberal arts, from agriculture sciences, from veterinary medicine, from public health, uh, from policy, bring all of those students together and have them work in a community setting on projects that they will be directly working in a hands-on kind of situation with the community. So our idea is that by doing so, they will not only get exposure to what is community-based research and how to work in a cross-cultural situation, but also how to communicate effectively across disciplinary lines. And uh, hopefully that would help them be effective in their future interprofessional teamwork if they get an opportunity to do so. And finally, this exposure that students have every year of five to six weeks of working uh, in, a, in a rural community in Botswana uh, would help them um, further develop their problem solving skills. There is uh, an important element of the Botswana program and that is the research part of it. So one is the experiential learning for students and then we have a research component that's built into that. And the idea behind it is building partnerships with communities and research institutions and government functionaries in Botswana uh, to, to create a sort of a grounds up team of researchers interested in certain areas of research and then another part of the research that we are doing in Botswana is to engage in community-based research. And we are in doing so, we are trying to gradually move away from the so-called expert model of research and embrace and move more in the direction of action, action research, more on the lines of ethnographic traditions, working with communities in a more direct and engaged manner uh, in all stages of research. So that's how we define CBPR or community-based participatory research. And the, and the idea is that perhaps this will lead us to a more sustainable form of research, building research relationship. So when I talk about the expert model, the way this expert model is imagined in the field of global health, and I'm sure it's not very different in other fields as well, is that you know, the way um, we are taught the, to, to think about research, generally speaking, is uh, to observe, uh, to identify a problem, develop a set of research questions, and then based on those research questions, think about conceptualizing a study design, identify research methods, um, and identify the kind of data that we will need to answer those questions. Go contact the community, seek approval from the community. Um, this is of course, um, you know, after we have received IRB approval. Um, so seek support and approval from the community, sometimes even hire some people from the community to participate in our research projects and seeking approval 
also requires convincing the community uh, about the importance of our research, not just from our point of view, but also from their point of view, then engaging in a data collection process, and then finally sharing the results primarily with the scientific community through, through publications, but also sharing the results if, if the questions demand or if the community expects with the community. Um, and hopefully those results can be put into some kind of a program intervention or policy. So we do share our results widely, even in the, in the so-called expert model. I know this is overtly simplistic, but just bear with me to think about, this is broadly what we, we do in the, in the expert model of research. And a good example of expert model of research um, I, I wanna use is, uh, it, it comes from Botswana. And uh, it won't take you long if you were to visit Botswana that within about maybe first week, you will realize uh, the signs of the law of a large presence of global health experts and global health programs funded by CDC and USAID in Botswana. So you see the expert model uh, writ large um, in, in your, even in your first trip to Botswana. And this is primarily because as you all may know that 18 years ago, Botswana had the largest number of HIV positive cases in the world, which added up to nearly 37% of Botswana's total population of 1.8 million at that time. So given the global spread um, of HIV, especially in countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean, the US responded by launching a program called as PEPFAR. And most of you have heard of that program as well, is the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief in 2003. And since then, this program has been reauthorized by the Congress, by the US Congress three times, and a total of $90 billion, billion with a B, uh, have been allocated to this program. So it's probably one of the largest funded program in the field of global health with 90 billion uh, going into it and the program still continuing um, since the year it was conceptualized, I think 2003. And George W. Bush launched this program. And this was one of the high points of his presidency when he launched this program, suggesting that uh, seldom has history offered a greater opportunity to do so much for so many. And this is a direct quote from his speech. Um, this program was initially very well received um, by the scientific community. Global health experts were very excited about that. And when this program was shared with the national governments in, of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the response from those, uh, from those governments was not as, an, as an enthusiastic as people were expecting, people in the West were expecting it to be. In fact, several uh, countries, including Botswana at that time, uh, um, agreed that HIV was a priority, was a crisis at that time, but they also um, uh, lobbied for funds for infrastructure development. They lobbied for funds for education uh, and they shared their list with PEPFAR experts or their, their list of priorities uh, with PEPFAR experts. And, and it was uh, at that time that uh, people uh, who were leading the PEPFAR program at that time felt that um, that was somehow distracting them away from their efforts to contain the HIV AIDS crisis in Sub-Saharan Africa. In the words of Andrew Naxios, who was at that time the head of USAID, in 2005, in one of his um, um, news media interviews, he was so frustrated that people in Africa were not jumping up and down and saying, you know, yeah, please, please bring these resources into the country that he was uh, a little frustrated and he pointed out that, uh, you know, uh, that it is futile to provide uh, antiretroviral therapy and spend so much money um, in Africa because Africans are not able to keep Western time and therefore they are unable to take scheduled medications. So as you can see that this program, although well-intended and well-intentioned well kind of represents what some 
uh, critics of this model have called as the global north essentially imposing its science, imposing its will, imposing its priority onto what you will call, generally call as the global south. So there were some differences of opinion, differences of priorities, and at times um, experts felt that um, African nations should have been welcoming PEPFAR with their arms wide open. Um, anyway, Botswana, you enter Botswana and you see these signs of Botswana's um, HIV rates, you see these little posters, uh, especially if you visit the ministry offices of 90, 90, 90, 90% 90 of the population, that's the PEPFAR target. 90% of the population should be aware of their HIV status. 90% should be on treatment and of which 90% should be virally suppressed. So those were the PEPFAR original goals and they have been changed over time, but this is where we are. Botswana is often described as a PEPFAR success story. Um, in Botswana, it is administered through the global AIDS program called as the GAP and the USAID and CDC team of experts in 2005. And these team of experts came from Harvard, University of Pennsylvania and Baylor College of Medicine. And these experts met with the leaders of the Ministry of Health in Botswana and completed a comprehensive inventory and analysis of the existing healthcare infrastructure in the country. Now, just to give you a little bit of a background on Botswana, Botswana is of the size of France with population of Oregon, about 2.1, 2.2 million, 2.3 million people. And uh, about 90% of Botswana's uh, um, geographic area is rural. Um, there, are, there are good roadways, good infrastructure there, but the communities are very sparsely located. So it's very hard to get from one community to another. Uh, about 20% or 30, 20 to 30% of the population lives in the capital city of Habaroni, which is the only major urbanized area in the country. And the rest of the population actually spread out through a 90% landmass of the country. So there are lots of remote rural areas in the country. And uh, so these group of experts just uh, realized that the current infrastructure and the, um, the, um, the healthcare, uh, healthcare expert expertise that was available in the country was, was limited. And therefore, they came up with a very, um, you know, at that time, very effective idea. I don't know how, whether they thought about sustainability of that idea or not, but at that time they decided that they were gonna create a sort of a parallel health infrastructure and not directly use the government infrastructure, especially in rural areas, uh, which was too poorly developed and understaffed to serve as a channel for HIV testing and HIV treatment. So they came up with two things. Number one, their focus will be on HIV testing and HIV treatment, that is the free delivery of ARTs. And number two, they will create a parallel structure next to the, the government structure uh, because that's, that would be the most efficient way to deliver healthcare in the country. So as a result of that, um, funding was not a problem. Uh, Botswana, uh, under the PEPFAR program, has so far received $807 million. Um, um, and so therefore um, has consider had considerable funding uh, for that. So uh, PEPFAR team ended up purchasing specialty vans that were converted and retrofitted into mobile clinics and 18 wheelers uh, that were brought in from South Africa, country to the south, and they were converted into mobile clinics and with mobile testing facilities, refrigerators to store ARTs. And um, so these 18 wheelers and these specialty vans became the, the mechanism through which uh, healthcare uh, delivery was, uh, was, was offered 
um, to rural populations of the country. Unfortunately, in the past five years, um, PEPFAR funding has significantly reduced um, and it has so reduced that uh, the government or even the PEPFAR team, they are unable to maintain those vans and those 18 wheelers, um, which if you had uh, asked people or some critical thinking people at that time in 2005 or 2006, they would have pointed that out. And I'm sure somebody definitely would have pointed that out to them. Um, PEPFAR funding has significantly reduced and there are rumors that we are hearing, at least I'm hearing in the ministry, that it'll completely dry up in the not so distant future. The idea being that now PEPFAR will be withdrawn and the government should be independently able to take care of their uh, HIV testing and treatment uh, facilities. Um, so as a proof of this reduction in funding, what we saw were several places where you have um, uh, dilapidated clinics, um, broken down vans that are on the sides of these clinic, these, these um, old uh, clinics and right next to them is you have um, a very well maintained, a very well built um, 18 wheeler on a mobile van, which nobody has used in the last two or five years. So something like that. So there were, there were certain challenges that one can, one can see that this expert model at that time, expert model of delivery that faced, uh, and that was that now we are finding ourselves in a very difficult situation as to how to transition from an emergency response, which was the goal in 2005, to a more su sustainable countrywide program. Now I'm using Botswana as an example. If you look at other countries where PEPFAR funding has gone, the situation is more or less similar, not very different. There are issues of capacity building that as part of the program, um, there was very little money allocated to integration of services. So you have these vans and these 18 wheelers going out there and providing HIV testing and HIV um, treatment services. And not many people are accessing these services because once you go to this van, the, everybody in the village knows why you are going there. So there were these issues of privacy which further and confidentiality, which further limited um, the accessibility and the use of these, uh, um, these services. And uh, there were very few programs that were put in place to train more nurses, more HIV, um, drug delivery experts, or even doctors. In fact, very as recently as 2015, uh, this issue was brought up at a big seminar that took place at Harvard as to what can we do to make um, the healthcare delivery model in Botswana more sustainable. And one of the things that was one of the prior priority areas was to actually build capacity within the healthcare system. Um, the focus of PEPFAR funding um, continues to be on testing and treatment rather than on prevention efforts. That doesn't mean that the government itself is not doing prevention efforts. In fact, uh, the government of Botswana has done a remarkable job in whatever resources they have available for, um, at their disposal to do, um, to engage in prevention, education, and um, sexual and reproductive health prevention efforts. But for the most part, those efforts have lagged behind in terms of investment of resources and also in terms of priority, defining priorities um, at the national level. I want to then quickly switch from the so-called um, expert model to what we are trying to do um, in, in Botswana and taking lessons from the last 15 years of PEPFAR's history, where we are trying to build relationships, um, you know, uh, where we're trying to build a research base and an experiential learning base uh, from grounds up. And uh, we wanted to kind of move away from the expert model and work with the ministries, work with government functionaries and work with community leaders and community members 
uh, to seek their help and their advice right from the beginning of the program. So we, uh, one of the things that we are doing, we are identifying the strengths and resources within the community and within the country to see if we can build on that. We are promoting community participation as far as our research and experiential learning is concerned. Uh, we are promoting community participation in all phases of our work. That means from the very beginning of even, you know, um, conceptualization of the problem, we are doing it in a collaborative way. We are regularly employing cyclical and iterative process to maintain community partnerships. And our hope is that um, once we have some results to share, we will be disseminating that knowledge uh, directly to the community and uh, directly uh, to our peers as well. So this is the, this is the figure eight model that, uh, um, that Tammy uh, has shared with me, uh, which is essentially a model that actually works uh, in, in, in more of an extension and outreach um, setting of research and relationship with the community. But this model has been very applicable and very useful, uh, has been very useful to us in our work in Botswana, where the research and the community are actually working in a more equitable and egalitarian manner where Yes, we have expertise and interest in certain area that we know more than others. Uh, we also are recognizing that community uh, has some indigenous knowledge, some understanding of what, what, the, what the issues are and they also have expertise. So we are trying to bring synergistically, bring these two sets of expertise together and learning directly through collaboration. And we are learning, we are collaborating and learning at the same time. As I said, community-based participatory work takes time and uh, our work in Botswana started in 2017 and we spent uh, the first year, I took about four trips to Botswana that year. And uh, in 2017, those trips primarily were to meet with government functionaries and also meet with community experts and, uh, and community stakeholders to learn from them, um, their thoughts about us coming and working with them. Uh, building rapport was primarily the goal that I had um, at that time. And uh, we were successful initially in, in building rapport and identifying key, key partners. In 2018, this was, a, this was a very taxing year because this is the, this is the year where we try to explain to members in the community why we were there and what we were doing and what were our intentions and, and uh, how long we will be there. Um, uh, and, and, and also please understand that all of this is happening with the filter of PEPFAR where communities felt that, that PEPFAR had come only for one purpose and that purpose may not have been everybody's priority. So they were looking at us from that particular lens. So it took us about two years to get to a point where in, in, uh, that we both, that both parties began to communicate in a way that we had some shared understanding um, about each other and our, our purposes. In 2019, uh, we were able to identify three areas of research priorities together. And as I said, that this is a collaborative set of, this is a list that we have collaboratively developed. One was a need for sexual and reproductive health education at the, at the middle school level. Uh, usually, typically, if you look at SRH education um, in, uh, in, in sub-Saharan African countries, uh, it primarily starts at the high school level, but this community um, was intent upon having this, this sexual and reproductive health education training begin at the middle school level because, um, because the sense was that, uh, that the middle schoolers is where this knowledge was needed. Um, then there was a shared priority of uh, working with children with disabilities in this particular community. 
there is a school that accepts uh, children with disabilities. So the community needed uh, our help in terms of mainstreaming disability, training teachers how to work with children with disabilities, and uh, in fact, becoming a, their voice uh, for policymakers in the Ministry of Education to provide more resources and services to children, not only in the community, but also in neighboring villages, um, um, as far as uh, uh, children with disabilities were concerned. And this is a program that we are very fortunate to have uh, Megan McDonald, uh, uh, Megan McDonald's expertise um, uh, available to us. So Megan has been with us uh, for almost two years now going there and has been helping us uh, with this project. The third project that is uh, that emerged in 2019 as a community priority was uh, uh, abuse of alcohol, was alcohol abuse, especially in the youth community and its relationship with uh, uh, risky sexual behavior and intimate partner violence. So why I feel good about these three priorities is that um, these priorities were identified by the community themselves. Of course, in conversations with us, but at, at, at one point we stepped back and let the community have their own conversation within themselves to figure out what those priorities were. Definitely we couldn't do everything, but so we asked them to prepare a shorter list of priorities and there were many other priorities that they came up with. But these were the three that they all agreed upon that they, that they wanna work with us on. We were originally planning to go this year um, and start um, identifying next steps and implementation plan, or if we needed to collect additional data before we propose some strategies to address these issues. Uh, unfortunately, we are not able to go there because we all want to be safe. So we will continue this work in 2021. So here are the last three or four years of my experience and uh, some of the lesson learned um, of, of doing work in Botswana is that although I am trained as, as an anthropologist and as an ethnographer, in this life, in my previous life, I was trained as a quantitative researcher, and I found that some of the skills that I had learned, especially um, some of the skills that were more demographic, more um, uh, structured data collection skills, uh, that they were very helpful. So one of, the, um, one of the lessons that I learned was that diverse field skills are vital if you are uh, proposing to work in a, in a, in a community based setting. Uh, patience achieves more than enthusiasm. Uh, frankly, um, I remain enthusiastic, um, but over the last four years, I have learned um, that patience is a, is, a, is a stronger virtue and that patience is um, more helpful. Reflexivity is an important research skill. Although uh, we don't teach, we don't talk a whole lot about what are some of the preconceived notions and biases that we bring as, as researchers to the field, uh, some of the things that we take for granted by virtue of our training, by virtue of our cultural affiliation, our ethnic affiliation, and that it is important, it's an important research skill to be able to reflect upon where I am coming from as a researcher and what some of the biases that I may be bringing uh, to the research. Um, it's not that we can address all of those biases and it's not that we can ever be bias free, but I think it's important to be aware of what those biases might be or what those preferences might be. You can't do it alone in a community-based participatory research. Uh, you need a team. I think that's probably the most obvious lesson that I have learned. Engaging community stakeholders in all stages of research is very, very important. It's vital. It's critical to sustainability of your work. And when I say all stages of research, I am specifically trying to, trying to emphasize that, that often we engage community stakeholders at a time when we are engaging in data collection, 
or when we are seeking permission to work in the community, we should be thinking about engaging community stakeholders at a time when we are conceptualizing a research problem. I know some of you may be thinking, well, that would become very difficult. I mean, how do I do that? I am, I am here, I'm sitting at my educational institution, defining, um, defining a research problem. Uh, how do I engage if I want to do community-based research? Um, how do I engage community at that early stage of, of my um, of development in my research process? Um, my short answer will be, it is worth it. If you can find a way to do it, it's definitely, definitely worth it. Second lesson I learned is communities are heterogeneous. It is very difficult um, um, to achieve a sense of consensus within the communities. And often when we talk about engaging communities, um, we, we might be mistaken thinking more simplistically about communities that they may speak with one voice or they may have one uh, shared set of priority that we, we, we will then easily be able to work with that. Um, the reality is really far from that. In fact, communities are uh, as diverse in their views and as opinionated as uh, faculty in a, in, a, in a diverse college. So I'll just leave it at that. And then consensus um, on any issue is, is rare. And then finally, seeking community engagement. I, I really want to emphasize that seeking com community engagement is, is critical to sustainability and it is critical to doing um, better research. Going forward, we have uh, two areas that we want to continue to develop. One is our research area where we have these three priorities and we will be working with. We will also continue to engage students on these annual um, experiential learning opportunities for, our, for, uh, for, for them. And uh, 2020 onwards, we will be starting as part of the Botswana Global Health Program, a small grants program for faculty um, in, in the college um, and also even the program will be open to faculty at OSU if they are interested in coming and uh, looking at Botswana as a place for their research and to look at uh, some exploratory, exploratory work that they wanna do, which might eventually translate into a research project primarily based on the principles of what we have just taught. So with that, I wanna thank all our partners. In fact, there are way more than I have listed here. Uh, but definitely I want to point out the College of Public Health and Human Sciences for the supports of my colleagues and the college leaders. I also want to point out the support that we have received, the financial support we have received from Robert and Sarah Rothschild Family Foundation and the Endowment Fund. The Ministry of Health and Wellness and the Ministry of Youth Empowerment in Botswana have been our steadfast partners. They are excited that we continue to meet with them, we continue to work with them, and that um, unlike in the past, um, we have not ignored them, where they, have, they felt they have been ignored in the past by other uh, American groups that have come in. And then uh, Oregon State University's athletics program has been very supportive. And last but not the least, the community of Mauna Tala, Botswana, where we work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sunil. Um, that was a really engaging presentation. And I really appreciated how you really emphasize including the community in various aspects, ranging from identifying the research question um, down to the data analysis. It's, and there's some students on that uh, know the rigor and the difficulty of doing this. Uh, you know, right now we're calculating inter-rater reliability and it's really difficult because you're bringing different perspectives, you're bringing different reflexive standpoints. So I really appreciate how you highlighted that in your, in your research. Uh, we have some uh, great questions from the, um, the audience here and I will go ahead and read those for you and you can address them. Um, 
And so the first one is from Kristen Yang. Um, and so Kristen would like to know how in the case that funding uh, would be taken away, would be reduced, um, how would this play out in the community's ownership of, uh, of, of health and of the ways you've developed to address different health issues? So what does it, I think this question is uh, dealing with the sustainability after research um, goes away, after research is no longer funded in various areas of global health. I think, I think that's a great question, Kristen. Thanks for asking that question. One of the things that we are doing is that as part of our research and experiential learning programs that we have in Botswana, we are building capacity. We are working very closely with the, with the Ministry of Health and also with the Ministry of Youth um, to identify people both in, in the health field and also within the community um, identify people that can work with us. And, uh, and that process itself has been very learning, very educational for us. So we have learned a lot from people that we are collaborating with. But in that process, we are also creating a sort of a team within the community. So it's, it's almost like we are uh, becoming catalysts for that kind of change in leadership within the community. And hopefully that that would add to the sustainability of the work that we have done. Now, regarding your question about the global pandemic, uh, I, think, I think that's a very important point that for us to think about because what happened in 2003 was something very similar. You know, with HIV was seen as this global crisis that, that, uh, that America and the rest of the global um, North wanted to deal with uh, right away. And uh, Sub-Saharan African countries were seen as the target of that uh, for very good reasons. But at that time, we were operating in a crisis mode. So that means our focus was on testing and treatment. Priorities like prevention, priorities like capacity building, that they, they got kind of, they got pushed to the bottom of the list and we kept focusing on responding in a crisis mode. And I think there are very good reasons, a good case to be one can make for responding in a crisis mode. Unfortunately, what's happening now is that with this COVID-19, we may end up back in that situation again, because we are once again, for no fault of our own, we are reacting in a, in a crisis mode. And I think this would be a time to actually think more broadly and more sustainably about the investment that countries will be making uh, in the global south uh, about um, prevention of the next epidemic. How do we manage that? Although these two situations are a little bit different and may not be as easily comparable, but I, but I hope that we, we will not react in a crisis mode this time. Wonderful. And there's another question um, by Dr. Vaishali uh, Patil, who uh, also wants to know about capacity building um, and wondering especially about why capacity building hasn't happened up to this point in spite of uh, a lot of funding going into Botswana from PEPFAR. And um, what can your team do now to start closing that gap? So first part of the question is why capacity building has not happened. So since 2005, there has been a lot of money going into um, testing and treatment. Capacity building um, is, it requires um, a lot of other pieces of the puzzle to be in place. So there, there has to be a set of trained, at least healthcare providers with some basic training at the ministry level or at the level, level of the healthcare delivery system. Botswana has, the country has two nursing um, schools and, mo and both of those schools are located in, uh, in, in Havaroni, in, in, in this urban area. And there are very few nurses who are trained um, um, and, and they want to go and serve in rural areas. And also the nursing training is very generalized, whereas 
this kind of a situation requires more specialized training. So there are limited specialized training because there are limited expertise available and there are very few people who are interested in, in that training. Uh, another point that I wanna make is that um, for, for capacity building, um, we have uh, in, in Botswana, there is one medical school, one medical school that is now is on its second class of medical students. And uh, we have not, the country has not graduated a single medical student from its medical school yet. So there are certain prerequisites, certain infrastructure pieces that need to be in place before we can effectively engage in capacity building. And all of this makes sense considering that Botswana's population is, uh, is, is very small uh, and majority of the population lives in rural areas and therefore very few people who actually come to urban areas for higher education. So you also have that issue that is impacting uh, capacity building efforts. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from another attendee who wants to know more about how your team generated collective action um, given the heterogeneity of the community. So how did you mobilize people um, to become involved? And, um, and maybe you can also describe how uh, differences amongst people in the community were resolved. That is an excellent question. And, uh, and I wish I had, I had like a straight answer for, for that. Um, um, but, and maybe I, could, I wish I could come up with a strategy that would say, okay, this is what's gonna work. Um, probably it all depends on the situation and it depends on so many other things that which group of stakeholders are at odds with, with what. So those issues became um, really central to that. At some point in this, in this, in this uh, process, our role became um, less visible. We faded into the background and we let the community resolve their differences. We let the community holders, stakeholders, talk to each other and resolve their differences. We were only present in those conversations as people who were providing information and answering information related questions. But if they were opinion related questions, we try to stay away from answering those questions. And it's very hard, especially if you ask an academic like me to not express my opinion, geez, that's my whole training and I'm supposed to do that. But it is hard to kind of go against that instinct that you have in terms of, um, you know, just sticking to information and trying to stay away from um, opinion or trying to stay away from adding any gravity to one view relative to another. And we found that, and it could also be, um, you know, um, intrinsic to Botswana culture where there is considerable emphasis in, is placed on group resolution of conflict rather than individual resolution of conflict. So in those settings, we primarily faded into the background and became information suppliers, but stayed away from siding with one group over the other. We wanted for the sustainability, long-term sustainability, and for the, for the project to make sense to the community or to majority groups in the community who wanted the community to make its own mind. So patience and this innate uh, desire to, to provide opinion at every point, preventing that, uh, uh, those are the two strategies that worked for us. Thank you. Um, and then we have one question uh, from Norm, Dr. Norman Horde, um, who would like for you to talk about um, the narrative that Africans, um, in quotes, are um, thought to not be able to uh, tell time um, that emerged when people were making arguments for or against providing antiretrovirals. Um, in that context, um, that's an excellent question, and it, you know, and it and it and it seems um, pretty um, pretty relevant when it comes to um, the um, consumption of 
AZT. So antiretroviral therapy uh, is, is kind of a group of drugs that have to be taken at a certain time during the day. Um, and, uh, and, and they are to be taken regularly without missing any dose. Um, and, uh, and dose, and if, and if uh, a person misses a dose, then the next, then don't double the dose next day, take the dose at the prescribed time. But if a person for some reason misses three or four doses in a row, then they have to get checked again because that is long enough time for the virus to mutate and the original drug may not be effective. So the drug needs to be adjusted. So it's a very sensitive uh, issue as far as the, uh, the intake of the drugs um, is concerned. This particular individual made a very ethnocentric statement in the sense that uh, for 2000, even for 2005, it was on borderline, you know, um, I would say a racist statement where saying that uh, Africans cannot keep Western time and therefore it, it will be futile to provide medication because they will not be able to take their medication on a prescriptive time period. So they will not understand the sensitivity of the drug intake or when they are to take their medication. So that is not the case at all. In fact, Botswana, as I mentioned later on, has turned out to be a success story where uh, we have a very large population of people living with HIV and taking their drugs on time and are showing up for their regular blood checkup, blood examination. Um, and, and therefore, so that, that particular statement was proven to be absolutely wrong. So I hope I answered Noam's questions. I was satisfied. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you. Um, and uh, we have a follow-up question uh, by uh, Susanna Park, um, who would like to know how you have addressed, um, you know, in, in, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, how you have addressed the difficulties in communication or how have you maintained relationships with folks in Botswana um, and your team? Um, maybe some strategies for people to maintain relationships. Um, during this time would be great. Susanna, thank you very much for asking a great question. In fact, um, I have been in regular touch with people in Botswana, both in the community and, and, and in the ministry. Fortunately, um, Botswana has, uh, um, has relatively good uh, internet coverage in the urban area. So I've been able to stay in touch with the with the, our, our stakeholders in the ministries, in the two ministries, letting them know about our plans of not coming this year, but then continuing to work with them what the next steps are and what progress we were planning to make this year, uh, sharing every uh, development that we are making on our side with them as soon as possible and then seeking their feedback. We just completed, um, a last year project report and the ministry was supposed to send me fee feedback on the report about a month ago, but because of COVID it was delayed. So we have been in touch with each other on a regular basis. And just last week I received their feedback. So we are keeping in touch with them. We haven't forgotten them and we are uh, making plans for 21. Great. Um, and then we have a follow-up question from uh, anonymous attendee um, uh, who would like to know about any partnerships you're forming with universities, uh, local universities in Botswana uh, to work on the three priority areas. Great question. Great question. And what, yes, so one of the largest universities and government funded universities is the University of Botswana uh, with its main campus in Habaroni. So we have been partnering with that university and our hope is that uh, with additional funding, we will be able to we'll be able to take OSU students over there, OSU researchers to Botswana, and then invite University of Botswana students and researchers to join our team and work together uh, in in these communities. So that's one very quick answer I can give you. So the floor is open at the moment. Um, are there any additional questions uh, from the audience to Sunil?
Steele, I'm wondering, I have a question. I'm wondering, you know, following up on Susanna Park's question about how you're maintaining relationships, um, have you at, thought about adding any, um, any uh, focus groups or any instruments that are delivered through uh, Zoom or online formats um, that would be securely delivered or addressing COVID in your research? Jonathan, you, um, your, your question um, kind of sparked a lot, a number of ideas, a number of things that we have been doing. Uh, we are uh, scheduling um, a Zoom-based focus group in about two weeks with the Ministry of Health. And that will be our first one. And then the second is with the University of Botswana. They have a School of Public Health. So we will be engaging in that conversation. So uh, right now we are using WhatsApp uh, mode for communication and emails. But I think as a result of this uh, particular situation, we will be using other technology. Uh, they, they do not have Zoom, they have Microsoft Meet um, as probably one of the software that I'm not familiar with. So I think we'll have to figure out which software we'll use. So yes, we are engaging in that. Wonderful. And we have a follow-up from Dr. Vashil Patil who would like to know if you are extending this work to other parts of the world. At this point, I am focused on Botswana and I want to uh, create opportunities for more of my colleagues and students to, to work in Botswana, um, hopefully in future. Yeah, definitely. Wonderful. Fun question. Let me read it before I ask it. Okay, what are you looking forward to most about returning to Botswana in 2020? Um, answer can be not work-related. Safari. Safari. Yeah, yeah. That Botswana gives you an opportunity to see uh, wild animals in their natural habitat. Uh, Botswana's government's motto is animals came here before humans did. So humans have to learn how to live with animals. And you get to see some of the most wild, rare animals in Botswana. And I really feel bad that we couldn't do it this year. Well, thank you so much, Sunil. It was an awesome presentation. I learned a lot about how to build partnerships um, and I'm sure that everyone will be inspired to use some of these skills in their own work. Thank you.